Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. Many of you may remember that I have done a critique of Ali Stuckey when she was on as a guest on the Ben Shapiro program. And she introduced to Ben uh, Calvinism and this concept and idea that God is ultimately the one who controls our decisions as to whether to follow and obey him or not. And yet we're still held responsible for those decisions. And Ben Shapiro asked the question I think we would all want to ask is how do you square that circle? In other words, how do you overcome what seems to the rest of us uh, intuitively to be a contradiction? Um, and we showed how she never really answered that question. She just simply quotes from passages of Scripture, which she thinks uh, do support the concept of, the, of divine determinism and human responsibility and just says, hey, well, the Bible is what it is. And it may seem contradictory to you, but this is what the truth is. And so you have to accept it. Um, and we just push back on that to say uh, we don't believe that the Bible uh, supports a contradiction, but instead that Ali and other Calvinists have simply misinterpreted Romans 9, for example, and other passages which seemingly support the Calvinistic worldview of divine determinism, and that that's not a pill uh, that needs to be swallowed. In other words, it is not a contradiction. When you understand uh, the, the context of the verse, you understand what Paul is intending to say to his audience, and understand uh, the verses that are often used to support the Calvinist system. And so many uh, uh, may be familiar with Ali. She is a, a conservative talk show host that's uh, really speaking to the millennial generation. Uh, the fact that she's talking about this on mainstream podcasts uh, and talking about Calvinism and introducing Calvinism to millennials of this generation just shows what we've been saying a long time is that uh, among young people, uh, Calvinism is resurging. It's growing. The concepts and ideas surrounding Calvinism are becoming more and more popular. I think it is just like what we've seen throughout history. Uh, Calvinism resurges, uh, has resurged about four times over the last 500 years. Uh, even Al Mohler speaks about that in one of his broadcasts and it always dies back out. And when we ask the question, why does it die back out? Uh, the only two possible answers is one, it either doesn't hold water theologically and philosophically, or uh, God has determined or decreed for it to rise up and die back out for some uh, unknown reason to us. And so I want to reply to Ali in, in kind. I, I, I don't dislike her. I agree, in fact, with a lot of her conservative uh, values and some of her principles. She uh, She's a, a, a podcaster and a, a blogger and uh and it works with blaze tv with glenn beck and and that whole group and so she she expresses a lot of conservative values and principles that many of us who listen uh to this program uh, very likely could agree with but we just simply uh, side differently uh, with her than uh obviously on the th sociological issue and and i i pray that those who listen to her and that though even even ali herself would consider other viewpoints besides that which <clears throat> she quotes from from uh, John Piper most uh, often, and she quotes from obviously other Calvinistic sources in this broadcast. But she's going to go through the T U L I P. Now, here's what I'm going to try to do. <laughs> you guys know who listen to me very long at all. I'm, I'm a little wordy, uh, a little uh, uh, verbose uh, in my speech. I, I go a, a little long sometimes. I understand that, and I understand that. Uh, it could it, you could have an entire episode on any one of the proof text verses that she reads, and so what I'm going to try to do instead of going over all of the verses in in uh, in detail is try to give a brief summary reply to some of the proof texts and comments that she makes as we go through this, knowing and having you know. I have had longer broadcast and blog articles and books on all of these verses that she brings up. And so I'm not going to do due diligence on every single verse in, in, in giving you a full exegetical commentary on every single verse, though those are offered uh, in other uh, locations for you. Um, I'm going to just try to simply give you the other side, the other perspective. As we've talked about here quite regularly, uh, when you see a, a passage, it's like seeing one of those bleaks that look like both the duck and the rabbit. Um, when you see the duck, it seems like that's all you can ever see. When, when you see the rabbit, it seems like that's the only thing you can see. Uh, you may have seen those same pictures with the old woman and the young woman, that kind of thing. And it's really frustrating uh, if you can see both pictures, but the person you're talking to can only see one, and you're trying to show them, look, that's where the eye is, that's where the chin is. See, see, there's where the ears are on the rabbit. There's the, that's the, the beak of the duck. And you're trying to explain to them the other side. 
Well, that's what I feel like I'm doing quite often on this broadcast is I'm talking to especially young Calvinists who may not be very uh, educated on both sides from the scholars from both perspectives. I'm trying to say, stop just for a second. I, I understand you see the duck when you read Romans 9. I understand why you see the duck when you read Romans 9. Um, but have you considered the other side? Have you considered the fact that the first 500 years of Christian history didn't read Romans 9 the way you do? And could it be that you have a a misconception about what Paul is talking about in Romans 9 or Ephesians 1 or some other passages that are used as proof texts. Have you considered the best scholars from the other side? Or in your echo chamber of Calvinism, have you only listened to other Calvinists describe Arminianism as being this God looks through the quarters of time to foresee who's going to believe and therefore elects or predestines them? And that's the only uh, really scholarly or other uh, perspective you've been given to consider, um, because that's the way most notable Calvinists have painted all of us who are not Calvinists as foresight faith Arminians, and they paint it in the most uh, silly or ridiculous light as possible, as we, we've even heard as we've played before Matt Chandler uh, talking about God getting into a DeLorean, a, a time travel machine, and traveling into the future to see who's going to believe, and those are the ones he elects, and that's the doctrine of election, and those are the ones he predestines, and that's our view of predestination. And obviously, uh, no scholar worth his salt would ever describe election or predestination in that manner whatsoever. And so I want us to be well-educated. I want you to be well-educated. I don't want you to only understand the scholars from the Calvinistic perspective, which is why we play them for themselves. I want you as millennials to understand uh, the best scholars from both perspectives. And I, I would think, and I know Allie, she seems to uh, know of her, obviously, and listen to some of her stuff. She seems like a very reasonable, very smart young lady. Um, I think she would probably agree with me if, if we were talking together. Uh, and she would say, yeah, you, you should be good Berean. You should question John Piper. And she even says in this broadcast, he's not um, infallible and he's not inspired. Uh, and, and neither are the, the confessions of, of uh, the Calvinistic groups. And so she's sola scriptura. She says, go back to the scripture. And so she would say the same thing. You need to test these things and to really begin to, to look at uh, the, uh, the principles that are needed for good hermeneutics and understand why the Calvinistic system might be uh, in error. Uh, and and to, to make yourself either a stronger Calvinist by understanding that or to leave Calvinism if you find it wanting after going through this process. And so I have fast forwarded a little ways here uh, to the 11 minute mark, in fact, where she has already given a little bit of the history of uh, the Calvinism, Arminian debate, and those kinds of things, and I really wasn't interested in that aspect of it. I want to jump right into where she gets into TULIP, the T-U-L-I-P, uh, the doctrines of Calvinism. And then, I, like I said, I'm going to try to give brief, if at all possible, answers to each of the proof texts and uh, quotes that she brings up in defense of TULIP. So let's listen in. Let's start with the T of TULIP. The T of TULIP in these five points of Calvinism is total depravity. So this is the state of man before salvation. Now, once you hear this, if you're hearing this for the first time, you will probably start to think about my theological episodes and be like, oh, I understand where Ali is coming from or where the foundation of Ali's interpretation of scripture, not my interpretation of scripture, but my understanding of scripture is coming from, and it's really coming from these five points. So T is total depravity. That's the state of man before salvation. John Piper says it like this. In summary, total depravity means that our rebellion is sinful. Our inability to submit to God or reform ourselves is total, and we are therefore totally deserving of eternal punishment. Uh, man's depravity. Okay, so just real quick, um, j just to answer that, th that basic definition of total depravity, we would believe that we are depraved, okay, and that we cannot reform ourselves. But that does not mean that we cannot confess our inability to reform ourselves and trust in the one who can. And that's part of the distinction and difference between what the Calvinist talks about when he talks about being sinful and depraved, because on Calvinism, you can't humbly confess your condition, even when it's clearly shown to you, unless you're given a new heart first. And so on Calvinism, God has to give you a new heart in order for you to confess you used to have a bad heart. That's cart before horse. Because as Ezekiel 18 says, he's, the, the scriptures say, confess your sins so as to get a new heart. It doesn't say that God will supernaturally just 
pick you before the foundation of the world and sometime during your life just magically or supernaturally give you a new heart and then all of a sudden you'll be uh, repentant and humble. The, the Bible puts that responsibility on you to humble yourself, the Bible says, over and over and over again. The Calvinistic system asserts, well, you can't humble yourself unless God has chosen you for no apparent reason before the world began. And he changes you supernaturally at some uh, undisclosed point in your life where you just wake up one day uh, having heard the scripture or having heard the revelation of God and the spirit moves on you in such a way as to give you a new heart. And now all of a sudden you have a desire, an overwhelming, uh, irresistible desire to humble yourself and to trust and believe in God. Um, that's never established in the pages of scripture for, as far as I can tell. Uh, every time the Bible talks about humbling yourself, it, it says humble yourself. It's your responsibility. And I don't think we should put a responsibility that the Bible puts onto us back onto God by saying, well, he's ultimately responsible for how you respond. I think it's irrational to call human beings responsible if God's actually the one responsible for how we respond to his appeals. And so I think that's where Ali is squaring the circle, so to speak, uh, that Ben Shapiro asked about making a contradictory statement, i.e. that God's responsible for what you're held responsible for. And I, I don't find that taught in the Bible. Gravity is total in at least, at least four of these ways. Um, our rebellion against God is total. Apart from the grace of God, there is no delight in the holiness of God. There is no glad submission to the sovereignty of God. Uh, Romans 3, 9 through 11, no, no one is righteous, no, not one. John 3, 20. Okay, so no one's righteous, no, not one. Does that mean, therefore, no one can confess their unrighteousness and trust in the righteousness of Christ? No. Okay. So that's the problem. The Calvinistic system will bring up verses about how we are not righteous and we can't earn or merit righteousness by works of the law. In other words, we all fall short. And they will quote those verses as if they support this concept of total moral inability, our inability to confess or humble ourselves and, and to confess our unrighteousness. And again, that's just not established in the pages of Scripture. And so quoting a verse about how sinful we are does not prove that we're incapable of confessing our sin. The analogy we used of a, uh, uh, someone who is an alcoholic, addicted to alcohol, just because he's addicted to alcohol doesn't mean he can't confess his addiction to alcohol and check himself into a rehab facility when his family confronts him in an intervention. Okay. Well, in the same way, when the, the law and the gospel confront you as a sinner, a sinaholic, are you capable of confessing your sin and checking yourself in to Christ, so to speak, uh, like checking yourself into the rehab facility? Are you able to say, yes, you're right. I can't stop sinning. I, I can't control that fact that, that I continue to sin. I continue to rebel. I continue to, to run from the things of God. I, I can't even confess that fact. I can't come home out of my pigsty and, and come to the Father and beg for forgiveness and to become one of his servants. I, I can't do that unless God does some supernatural, irresistible work on my heart to make me want to do that. Um, I, again, just don't find that established in the scripture. 20 through 21, everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. So, so whoever does what is true comes to the light. So those who don't want to humble themselves, in other words, they, they, don't, they, they refuse to humble themselves, not that they couldn't, they refuse to. They resist the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit brought by the, the law and the gospel. Um, they will grow hardened and calloused, and they can grow more and more hardened and calloused to where eventually they don't hear the conviction of, of the conscience that's built within them. Their, their conscience can become seared. It's not already born seared. It's not already born calloused, okay? So a person can grow calloused if they continue to resist the Holy Spirit and his call and his conviction upon them, but they're not already born in that condition as the Calvinistic system presumes. So that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So apart from the work of God, uh, we hate the light of God. Uh, we will not come to him because we don't want our evil to be exposed. So we are totally rebellious to God. Um, in our total rebellion, everything we do is sin. So Romans 14, 23, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So we are in total rebellion. Everything that we do is a product of sin. Without faith, the Bible also says it is impossible to please God. Uh, 
And that's true. It, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what should we do? Well, then we should believe. And so that, that's what that, that passage is talking about. If you don't act in faith, in other words, if you don't trust in God, then you can't please him. Therefore, what's the onus on you? To trust in God, to, to believe in him, um, to put your faith in him. That's, that's what the scripture is talking about. So you can't take that passage as to support the concept of total inability. It's simply a call for us to say, you, you, you're not going to make it unless you put your trust in God. You've got to come out of your pigsty. You've got to confess your sin. You've got to humble yourself and, and throw yourself at the mercy of the only one who can help you. Uh, Romans seven eighteen. this is Paul speaking. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So and he's confessing that. And so are you, you're, you're to do that as well. So the fact that Paul is confessing, nothing good and dwells within me, I have to trust in you, that's what your responsibility is. So your responsibility is to confess your inability to save yourself or to merit salvation. That is your responsibility, to humble yourself and throw yourself at the mercy of the one who can save you. So nothing in us is actually good. Uh, we have an inability to submit to God and to do good. That is completely and totally true of us. Romans 8, 7 through 8. The mind that is set... Okay, so notice what she just said. She just she just summarized the doctrine of total inability. We have an inability to submit ourselves to God. Okay, and now listen to what she's about to read. She says, the, those whose mind is set on the flesh. So she's assuming you don't have any control of where you set your mind. Okay, which is not established in the Bible either. Okay, so she says, those whose mind is set on the flesh... And then she's about to read this passage out of Romans chapter uh, 8. And so let's see if it supports this concept of moral inability from birth to do anything other than to set your mind on the flesh and therefore not submit yourself to God or his ways. On the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. The so your inability to submit to God's law means you're also unable to submit to his offer of grace. It's ultimately what she's saying. So because you can't fulfill the demands of the law, you also can't confess that fact and trust in his grace and rely upon his grace. Does the Bible say this? No. Matter of fact, that's exactly the opposite of what Paul is trying to say. He's saying because you can't submit yourself to the law and fulfill the demands of the law, therefore your only hope is to do what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteous. Does that mean Abraham earned his righteousness by believing? No, if he did, then there would be no reason for Jesus to come and die. He could just say, oh, well, Abraham, you earned salvation by means of belief. Well, we know that's not the case. Abraham did sin. He did fall short of God's glory. He did, he does need uh, the, the atoning work of Christ, despite the fact that he was a believer, okay? So even believers, even those who humble themselves, don't merit their salvation. They need the grace of God to cover their sin. And so just like Abraham, you're called to believe so as to be credited with the righteousness of Christ. So belief doesn't merit or earn your own righteousness. Okay, you're not, it, it's a filthy rag without the atoning work of Christ. So even if you humble yourself, it's a filthy rag. Even if you believe in Jesus, it's a filthy rag. It's only because of Christ's work on the cross. It's only because of his sacrifice that God graciously and justly credits us with his righteousness, his goodness. And that's where we rest in. His righteousness, his goodness, not our own. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So so those whose minds set on the flesh can't please God. That's true of a Christian as much as it is of a non-Christian. So today, even as a Christian, if you set your mind on the flesh and you act in accordance with the flesh, are you going to be pleasing to God? No, of course not. If instead you set your mind on the spirit and act in accordance with the spirit, will you please God? Yes. So if I can say that exact same thing to a Christian as I would say to a, a lost person, and it doesn't mean inability to a Christian, then why would you assume it means inability to a lost person? You see what I'm saying? So you can't assume that because it says the mind that's set on the flesh can't please God, therefore you have no control as to whether you set your mind on the appeal of God through his spirit to uh, be reconciled through faith. And so again, th this passage out of Romans 8 is contrasting those who are filled with the spirit versus those who are not yet filled with the spirit. Those filled with the Spirit can please God because they have faith. And only by faith can you please God. Therefore, the call of Paul would be to confess your sins so as to get a new heart, so as to receive the Spirit, so that you can live in faith and please God. So that's the call of, of Romans chapter 8. It's not saying that because um, 
uh, you, you uh, have flesh or because you're fleshly, therefore you have no responsibility, i.e. ability to respond to God's spirit and life-giving truth. There's, there's nothing there about the transition from being in the spirit uh, to being in the flesh or being in the flesh to being in the spirit. There's, there's nothing there about the transition between those two. And even in the Calvinistic order salutis, what's interesting is that they don't even believe that you're indwelled by the spirit until after faith, because there's too many passages that talk about how he doesn't indwell us until we have faith. And so they, in their order salutis, their order of salvation, the Calvinistic scholars will explain that there's some kind of a quickening or a pre-faith regeneration that takes place where he makes us alive, therefore we believe, and then after faith, then we are indwelled by the Spirit of God. But if you read Romans 8, it doesn't make any of those distinctions. It just is drawing the distinction between those who are filled with the Spirit, already indwelled by the Spirit, versus those who are not yet indwelled by the Spirit. And so you would have to assume that Paul was contrasting those who have been quickened but not yet filled with the Spirit versus those who had not yet been quickened. And again, that's a stretch beyond stretches to try to think that that's what Paul is doing in Romans chapter 8. It simply does not support the idea or concept that, uh, that, that we are totally morally incapable of responding to God's life-giving truth. That would give back the very excuse that he takes away in Romans chapter 1 when he says these, these truths are clearly seen and clearly understood so that all stand without excuse. I can't think of a better excuse in the world than I was born uh, in this natural capacity, this natural incapacity from birth by God's decree where I could not willingly submit to his truth and to his call to repentance and faith. And so because of my fall, because of the fall of Adam, and I'm represented in Adam because of that fall, I have become now morally incapable of responding to God's appeal to be reconciled from that fall on Calvinism. Is that taught in Scripture? Where? Does it say Cain and Abel had this inability? No. <laughs> he, he talked to Cain as if he was able to do what Abel did and bring a right sacrifice. He didn't speak to Cain as if he was morally incapable of doing this. And none of the, the, the people they're following uh, the, the, the fall um, are treated by God as if they're now morally incapable of responding to his word and his truth. Um, that's just never established in the Bible. The fall, yes, it causes labor pain. Yes, it causes the toiling of the soil. And yes, it causes us to be separated from God as we're cast out of the garden. And that's what spiritual deadness is representing. Us being cast out of the garden, that, that's a form of separation from God. Just like the prodigal son was called dead. He was lost, but now he's found. He's alive. That means he's brought back into communion with the Father, back into relationship with the Father. It does not mean moral incapacity to respond. This is why Jesus calls the church in Sardis. He says, you're dead. Wake up. Return to your first love, he teaches them. Does that mean they're morally incapable of, of repentance and coming back to their first love as, the, as, the, as a church, as the believers in Sardis? Of course not. Deadness, idiomatically, in the first century does not mean moral incapacity. It means separation due to rebellion. And so when you take passages out of their historical context and you try to apply them to a systematic, it might sound like Calvinism has support. But I assure you, if you look at each of these verses, there is nothing in any of these verses that teach this concept that you are born in this hopeless, helpless condition and incapable of doing what God calls you to do, which is to trust in Christ. In our natural selves, we have a mindset that is not able, not even capable uh, to submit to the Lordship of Christ. Ephesians 2 1 says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are dead, so we are incapable of any spiritual life in God. So, see how yeah, she did that? She, she takes the deadness, which means separation due to rebellion, like the prodigal son story. And she applies that to her systematic, what she's been taught by John Piper and other Calvinists, is that, oh, deadness means moral incapacity to respond positively to God's life-giving truth. And that's just never established in the, in the scripture. Because a dead person is not capable of doing anything. Uh, and also, it's interesting that in, I think it's Romans 6, where Paul says that Christians are to be dead to sin. Now, I wish that meant that we were incapable of sinning. I would love if Christians, once we, once we receive the Spirit of God, that we just became morally incapable of sinning. But I, I think all of us who are honest with ourselves know that's not what happens. So when Paul says we're to be dead to sin, what does that mean? Does that mean we're morally incapable of sinning? Obviously not. What it means is we're to separate ourselves 
from sin. In the same way we were separated from God outside the garden, we are to separate ourselves from sin so that it does not rule us. And so that, that's the, the concept of, of deadness, is separation, like the soul is separated from the body. Well, you're dead to God, meaning you're separated from God due to rebellion. It does not mean that you're morally incapable or uh, you have a, you've lost your ability to respond, your responsibility to God's call to humble yourself and to repent. We have life, but we have physical life, but our hearts, our spiritual hearts are like stones to God. And Ephesians 4 also... Uh, Notice that she just assumes that we're born with stony hearts. The Bible does not teach this. As we've gone through out of uh, uh, Acts chapter 28, verse 23 and following, uh, all the way through verse 28, notice it contrasts the Jew and the Gentile. And it says that the reason that they're ever seeing but not perceiving ever hearing but not understanding, is because their heart has grown calloused because of their continual rebellion against the voice of God. As Hebrews 3 and 4 warn several times, when you hear the voice of God, do not harden your hearts. That's the stony hearts he's talking about. In other words, you can become ever seeing but not perceiving if you continue to reject the things of God. We're all sinners, yes, we've all fallen short, but not everyone is at the same degree of hardened, stony hearts as the Calvinistic system presumes. That everyone is already in this stony heart rebellion, so much so that they can't see, they can't hear, they can't reply. Despite the fact that Jesus pulls up a random child and says, you must become like this child. You must be humble like this child in order to king enter the kingdom of heaven. For, uh, for in heaven are people like this, <laughs> young uh, children who are humble. That means they're moldable. Does that mean they're innocent and sinless? No, it means they're able to hear. They're able to respond. And you cannot respond if you've grown calloused and hardened to the things of God until that callous hardness is broken away, which sometimes is done through circumstances like a pigsty event. Um, and it can, uh, you, one can eventually, obviously, uh, leave their, their pigsty or their rebellion and their stony hearts. But you can't assume, as Ali and the Calvinistic system has done here, is that you're born already in that hardened, callous condition. Uh, talks about this as well, that we are callous, we are darkened in our understanding, we are alienated from the life of God. So we are totally cut off, totally depraved apart from Christ. And because of that, our rebellion is totally deserving of eternal punishment. Ephesians 2. See, I, I think our view makes people who rebel and are unbelief more deserving of punishment, okay, because it's something they have control over. And on the Calvinistic system, she's ultimately saying that the unbeliever is, is deserving of hell and punishment despite the fact that they couldn't have done otherwise, despite the fact that they were born, created by their maker, with a, a an incapacity to uh, humble themselves or to reply to his appeals to be reconciled. And in our view, I think the blameworthiness of man is much stronger, uh, much stronger and much more established biblically, because ultimately they're not hating a God who first hated them. They're not rejecting a God who first rejected them, like a Calvinistic system would imply. Instead, on our view, they're rejecting a God who loves and has provided atonement for them. They're rejecting a God who has held out his hands to them all day long. They're rejecting a God who loves and provides. On Calvinism, they're rejecting a God who ultimately decreed for them to be born in a quote-unquote natural condition, which, by the way, to say something as a natural condition on Calvinism is simply to say it's, it's by decree. It's by God's decision. Nothing is, is uh, outside of his control, and it's therefore to say it's natural is just to say it's by God's decree. So you're born in a condition by God's decree where you're morally incapable of replying to his truth, and yet they still think you're blameworthy for that. And I, I think that is the square circle, as Ben Shapiro put it. You're ultimately saying a person is responsible who's not able to respond because of a moral incapacity from birth that they have absolutely no control over. So you've actually removed Ali, I think, uh, in respect to you. I think you've removed the very blameworthiness and the responsibility that you are claiming they are responsible for, for reasons that just seem insurmountable. And this is the very mystery that even Calvin appealed to when he says he doesn't know how people are, are, are not held, uh, our people are held responsible for things that God ultimately controls. He appeals to mystery on those kinds of things. Why? For this very reason. 
that ultimately people are being held responsible for things that God's ultimately controlling. Three, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So just our natural selves were carrying out what we want, and we were by nature, by our own nature, we were children of wrath. So this. And who controls the nature from birth? Who decided that our nature from birth would be such that we could only reject and hate even God's appeals to be reconciled from that fallen condition? On Calvinism, that's all on God. Now, I know Calvinists are well-intending because what they're trying to do is give God all the credit for salvation. But in doing so, they've taken it beyond the Scripture. And they're, what they're doing philosophically and logically is ultimately putting God as the author and the prover of transgressions in that he has decreed even the rebellion and the rejection of every sinner. And that is a problem. And that I think that flies in the face of what we learn about God's holiness, uh, his longing desire, his holding out his hands, uh, the expressed uh, 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 desire of God for all to turn so as to be saved. All of those verses come into to deep question when you impose the Calvinistic system over the top of them. This means that apart from Christ, our very nature is under God's wrath. Our very nature is condemned like the rest of mankind, the verse says. So we were children of wrath. We were destined towards damnation uh, because we were dead in our sin. That is who we are, completely corrupt, completely depraved apart from God. As John 3.18 says, those who do not believe in Christ are condemned already. So we are completely worthy of blame apart from the grace that God gives us uh, through Jesus Christ in hell is the punishment uh, that our sin and that our rebellion in our natural state deserves. Now, as Calvin... And again, I just think that's so much more deserving if that rebellion is in the face of God's grace and mercy and provision versus in the face of his rejection of us before we're ever born. And so when, when, you're, when you're calling a reprobate, a non-elect person, blameworthy, it's really hard sell uh, for anybody with any intuitive understanding of human responsibility because you're ultimately having God uh, condemn people for something that's beyond their control. Um, and this is one of the reasons we, uh, we, we, we're repulsed by racism, for example. Uh, you're holding somebody responsible for their skin color or for their gender, uh, for those who are bigoted towards women, for example. Um, we, why, why does that repulse us intuitively, even as Christians? Why, are we, we, why do we push back on that? Why? Because you don't have any control of your skin color. You don't have any control over your gender. We shouldn't hold people responsible for that. Instead, we, we judge them by the content of their character. But on Calvinism, they have no more control over the content of their character than they do the color of their skin or their gender. And that's why this should be intuitively rejected, the same way that we should intuitively know racism is wrong and that we know uh, gender uh, um, bigotry is wrong is for the exact same reason we should know Calvinism is wrong, because it's ultimately bringing people in judgment for something they have absolutely no control over. Uh, ultimately. Um, now, I understand that the Calvinists will argue against that and they will say, well, you do have control over it because you're doing what you want. And if you're doing what you want, then it is your ultimately responsibility. In other words, you're blameworthy for that. But if your wants are controlled by God, someone other than yourself, by nature, i.e. from birth, then you, th it, that collapses on top of itself into just plain old hard determinism because ultimately God is the one who's controlling what you want. And therefore, to be judged based upon what you want when someone else is controlling your wants, that is intuitively unjust and, and removes the blameworthiness of man, as well as the praiseworthiness of the one who's bringing judgment against those who have no control over their actions and behaviors. Venus point out, this does not mean that everyone who is apart from Christ, everyone who is a Christian, are as bad as they could be. Of course, that's not true. Right. And so they're not all like Hitler or Jeffrey Dahmer. They're not all as morally bad as they could be, but they all on Calvinism are as blind spiritually as they could be from birth. They're all calloused in that sense of that they cannot see, hear, understand, and turn to God for repentance as they could be. And that's the problem. In the same way that you believe there are degrees of immorality, like there's the Mother Teresa's of the world and the nice little grandmother that lives across the street and bakes cookies for all the people in the neighborhood, but she doesn't know Jesus. There's that level of morality. She's a good lady. She pays her taxes. She does well, all the things that are right, but she doesn't know Jesus. She doesn't believe. That level of morality versus the Jeffrey Dahmer who are cutting up and eating people in his basement, kind of immoral. Both of them are lost sinners, but one of them is much more moral than the other. And so what your statement there is qualifying is, yes, even the, the, the 
nice little moral grandmother is not as bad as the Jeffrey Dahmer or the Charles Manson of the world. But and, and so she's giving that qualification. But both of them on your system are as blind as they can be. They are both incapable, morally speaking, of seeing, hearing, and responding to God's life-giving truth because of a condition that they have no control over from birth due to the fall of Adam. And I'm saying, Scripture, verse, where, where is that? Because all the verses you've mentioned so far and the ones you're going to continue to mention, if you really ex- observe them, I think you'll find, if you're objective, say nothing about this moral incapacity that you're assuming on top, uh, on top of the text, really reading, again, a misreading of the concept of deadness as meaning moral incapacity versus separation due to rebellion, that you do have responsibility to confess and come home from your pigsty. Uh, that, that you're, that's the call of Scripture, and it's what you're able to do, and that's why you're held responsible for it true. Uh, As we've said before, there are non-Christians who live moral lives, who abide by biblical principles without even realizing it. They love their neighbors as themselves, for example, but total depravity speaks to both our capacity for evil and our complete unworthiness before a holy God in our natural state. Uh, The only way to be made clean uh, in our natural state is through Christ and Christ alone. So that is total depravity. We are totally depraved. We are totally dead in our sin. We are totally incapable of saving ourselves. Okay, so a lot of times Calvinists will do this, um, and and they'll they'll conflate um, faith in God with saving yourself. In other words, if you are free to put faith in God or not to put faith in God, therefore to put faith in God is saving yourself, okay? That's almost like saying the prodigal son returning home is the one who restored himself to the father when he got there. No, no. The father was the one making the choice as to whether to restore the relationship or not. Okay, he could have had the stones, uh, the son stoned to death justly for what he did in his rebellion. Okay, uh, he could have just made him a slave. What is the father's choice? The father's choice is to restore the son. So, who's responsible for the restore, restoration of the son? The, the father is. Okay, so the son is responsible for yes his sin, and he's responsible to humbly confess it. But the Father is responsible for the salvation. So when Peter in Acts chapter 2 says, save yourself from this corrupt generation, is he saying literally you're the one who's going to save yourself? No. What he's saying is trust in Christ for your salvation. And it, it, the, the analogy that's often used is um, if, if you have an illness, if you have a sickness, and the doctor gives you medication and says, uh, if you don't take this medication, you will die. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to die in two weeks from now unless you take this medication. Here's the pills. Take the pills. And so on one sense, you could say, okay, the doctor saved me because the doctor gave me this pills, the, the, these pills to take that would save me. You, in another sense, you could say, I saved myself because I took the pills. I, didn't, I could have refused to take them, just let myself die. But you could say, in that sense, I saved myself. Now, nobody would go around boasting about, hey, I took pills, so I saved myself. But you, you in one sense, can say that. Take the medication so as to save yourself. Uh, you could also say, well, the, the scientists that came up with that medication, they're the ones who saved me. And all of those in one sense would be true, but none of them are completely uh, accurate. And so the scientists have to play their part of coming up with a cure. The doctor has to play his part with diagnosing you correctly and giving you the medication. And then you play your part by actually taking the medication. And in the same way, salvation is of the Lord. He is the one who has provided the means through the atoning work of Christ for whosoever to be saved. But what's your responsibility in that? Your responsibility is to humble yourself and confess, to come home from your pigsty and put your trust in him. Um, the you in TULIP is unconditional election. So this is the work of the Father in salvation. So because we are totally depraved apart from Christ, because uh, the Bible says that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And apart from Christ, we are dead in our sins. That means that we are only saved through God's choosing, through God's power, through God's election, not our own effort. As Ephesians 2 says, this is not a result of works so that no one can boast. Okay, so what she's done is she's equated humbly trusting in his works as a work itself. So the analogy I've used before is if you're climbing a rope and the rope is attached to heaven and it's in this infinitely high rope and you think the only way you can get to heaven is by climbing the rope and then God comes down and says, 
you're never going to make it. You will always fall short. And climbing the rope represents the law, for example. You're working your way to heaven. You're never going to make it. Your only hope is to let go of the rope and trust in my son to catch you and to carry you up. That's your only hope. And because, on Ali's view, on Calvinism, because you can't climb the rope, therefore, letting go of the rope would also be a work. It would be an effort on your part. And so you can't let go of the rope and trust in Christ either. So because you can't climb the rope, which is an effort, that's a work, therefore, you also can't trust in Christ to carry you up the rope because that would be also your effort. So what God has to do is he has to not only um, does, does he have to come and die and, and carry you, but he has to also irresistibly change your heart to make you want to let go of the rope. Again, if the Bible taught that, then I would agree, but just the Bible never teaches this. The Bible puts that on you. The Bible says, humble yourself. It didn't say, I will irresistibly humble you. You're the one who's to let go of the rope. You're the one who's to put your trust in him. So don't put something that God puts onto you back onto him because that's removing human responsibility. We covered uh, this point in particular on the episode of uh, involving predestination or on predestination. So again, go back and listen to that if you have questions about this particular point. Uh, we are so depraved and dependent on God uh, for his grace to be born again, which was purchased by the blood of Christ. Uh, the success of our salvation is then dependent on God's election. So John Piper says that election refers to God's choosing whom to save. It is unconditional in that there is no condition man must meet before God chooses to save him. And we know this from the biblical text that election does not happen because of our faith, but it happens. It actually happens before our faith. So Acts 13, 48, and when the... Okay, so before she goes to Acts 13, 48, which we spent a lot of time on, uh, let me cover some of the issues. She's te teaching pre-faith regeneration. In other words, you're born again in order to believe. When the Bible actually says, these things were written, speaking of the gospel, John 20, 31, these things were written so that you may believe, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So that, that's the order. We also see this in John 5, 40, when he says, you've refused to come to me so as to have life. Whereas on Calvinism, if Calvinism is true, he should have said, I have refused to give you life so that you would certainly come to me. And that's just not the order of salvation. The order is to come to him in order to have life not the other way around. And this concept of election um, being in eternity past for no apparent reason, what I mean by that, there's no known reason why God chose you as opposed to someone else. I understand that Calvinists believe that their reason is 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 his glory uh, and his fame and his, and his, uh, in his own secret counsel. I, I'm, not, I'm not disputing any of that. I'm talking about his reason for or, uh, choosing you as opposed to somebody else he could have chosen for that purpose. Excuse me. Um, and so that's, I think, an important uh, distinction to draw out here is that election, according to Matthew 22, the parable that Jesus gives about election, the many are called, but few are elect passage. You, you're, you're familiar with that verse, right? Matthew chapter 22, he tells a story and he says there's a king that's over a kingdom. The king is representing God. The kingdom is representing Israel. OK, and he has servants that he represent that they're representing the prophets and the apostles, the messengers who are called together to say, I'm having a wedding banquet. The wedding banquet is representing heaven. OK, the final destination, the glory uh, of being with God forever. OK, and so the king is saying, my son is getting married. I want to have a wedding feast. And here's the invitations, prophets, apostles, messengers that I've chosen. I want you to go take this message to the high, to to the my people first in my kingdom to Israel, and what happens? The messengers go, the prophets in, in specific go to Israel, and they are stoned, they are rejected, all kinds of bad stuff happen, right? So they come back to the king, they tell him what happened. He's furious. He says, "Fine, take these invitations to the highways, the byways, to the good and bad alike, to whosoever will come, take them anywhere." Okay. All of those are choices of God. Those are elections of God. He chose the nation he would rule over, Israel. He chose the servants, the prophets and the apostles that would come together to bring that message to other people. He doesn't choose them because they're more moral. He didn't choose Jonah because he was a, a better person than some other prophet. He didn't choose Paul because he was better than Gamaliel or some other Jew of that day. He chose them unconditional on of their, uh, their morality. In other words, he doesn't choose them because they're more moral than somebody else. God chooses weak vessels 
to shame the rise. As a matter of fact, the reason he chose Israel, according to Deuteronomy, is because they were a weak and, and, and a lowly nation, not because they were great and mighty. If, if Gideon's army is too big, what does God do? He pairs it down and makes it a small army. He doesn't choose David's older brothers. He chooses the little shepherd boy out in the, the fields. Why? Because God chooses to bring about his service, to bring about his purposes. He chooses weak vessels. And so there is a condition in the sense that he's chosen this weak nation and he's chosen servants who are also weak so as to humble the wise, so as to demonstrate his power through them. And so he chooses prophets, he chooses apostles. And who does he choose to send the message to? To the good and the bad alike. In other words, I'm choosing to send this message not based upon morality, but to anyone and everyone who's willing to come. But that is all about many are called. So far in this parable, it's just about the many are called. But who are the few who are elect? We'll go on and listen to the rest of the story. People begin to show up. Some of them aren't coming clothed in white wedding garments. In other words, they're coming, but they're not ready. They're not prepared for the banquet. And so what does the, the king do? The king says, see that guy over there who's not dressed in wedding garments? Have him cast out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, there is a condition for being elect. You have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, the right wedding garments, in by faith. So by believing in Christ, you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. In other words, you are coming prepared for the banquet. So the many are called, unconditional choice of the nation, unconditional choice of the individual servants, not based upon their morality, unconditional choice of where he sends the message to, to the good and the bad alike, but who is granted entrance into the wedding banquet? The elect. Few are elect. What does that mean? Few are those who are going to enter in because few are those who enter through faith in Christ. They come entering by his righteousness, not their own. They come prepared by faith, by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. That's election. That's corporate view of election, by the way. That's what we would believe the doctrine of election is. But notice there's several aspects of election. There's also the election to service there. Why? Because he elected Jonah. He elected Paul. He elected his apostles, the servants that take out the, the message. He did elect them. That's a choice of God. So there's an election to service in that parable. And there's also the election, corporate election, that you are elect in Christ, meaning if you're clothed in his righteousness, if you're under his headship, then you are elect in the Son, as Robert Schrank put it in his book. You're elect in Christ. You're clothed in his righteousness. That's the doctrine of election biblically. Gentiles heard this. They began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So as many okay, and I've done uh, episodes and I have an article. If you'll go to Sociology 101 uh, and type in Acts 13, you can read the context of Acts 13 and recognize he is speaking to people from earlier in the chapter who worship God. Um, what we've got to understand is their contrast for Paul and the New Testament authors is Jew versus Gentile, not monergism versus synergism or Calvinism versus Arminianism. Because if you look at verse 26 of that same chapter, he says the Jews have reckoned themselves as unworthy of salvation. And then he goes on to talk about the, the, the Gentiles who are believing. And so it's a contrast here is not between individuals being uh, selected before the foundation of the world and somehow irresistibly caused to believe or not. He's talking about um, the difference between the Jew who has considered himself unworthy of, of salvation because his hardened rebellion and callousness towards the things of God versus those who are um, uh, disposed towards salvation, who are ready to hear, who are ready to listen, just like we saw in Acts 28, verse 28, when he says, I'll take the message to the Gentiles and they will listen. Again, go to uh, Sociology 101, type in Acts 13, and I give a full commentary verse by verse through Acts 13 to explain how Calvinism is not implied in verse 48. And he as were appointed to eternal life believed. John 10, 26, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep, Jesus says. Okay, let's talk about that. Remember what sheep means idiomatically in the first century, all right? Sheep is a follower. So if I call it, oh, well, you're a sheep. You're just a Kool-Aid drinker. You're just a sheep. What am, I, what am I saying even in our context? I'm saying you're a blind follower, okay? Well, those who followed the Father were sheep. What would a sheep do who followed the Father? He would follow the Son. Why? Because the Father and the Son are one. He's the shepherd that the Father of this fold has sent. And so what Calvinists are overlooking is the category of people in the first century 
who were believers in God, like Cornelius, for example. He pleased the Lord. Uh, Lydia would be another good example of this. She was a God-fearing worshiper of God. Okay, These are people that would have been considered, in the mind of God, sheep. Why? Because they followed the Father. Now, they didn't know who Jesus was yet. The revelation hadn't been made known yet. Okay, So they are sheep, followers of God, genuinely believing in God, fearing God genuinely, deep down, but they did not know Jesus yet. They did not know of him. And so when Jesus says, you do not believe in me, the son, because you are not a follower of the father, a sheep, he's not saying, you don't believe in me because I don't really want you, because that's what Calvinism would ultimately be saying. You don't, really be, you don't believe in me because you're not one of the unconditionally chosen ones before the foundation of the world, and I don't really want you. That's, that's what ultimately Ali is reading John 10 to mean when Jesus says, you don't believe in me because you're not my sheep. She's ultimately reading Jesus saying, you don't believe in me because I never wanted you, and I'm not going to die for you. I don't love you. You're not, you're, my, you're not one of my unconditionally chosen elect people. Sounds like a really good excuse for them to be rebellious because actually they're rejecting a God who rejects them first, unconditionally. That doesn't make any rational sense in the context of all of Scripture where he holds out his hands to them and longs to gather them and weeps over them and all the things that he says about Israel. That doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is when you understand what sheep means in that context. You won't believe me, the son, because you're not a follower. You're not a sheep of the father. Those who follow the father, they will listen and learn from the son. If you haven't listened and learned from the father, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to listen and learn from the son because we are one. And I speak what he wants me to speak. So that's the context of John 10 and, and John 6, frankly, what she's going to get into a little bit later. John 8, 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And so the reason they're not of God on Calvinism is because God doesn't want them to be, ultimately. He, he didn't love them. He didn't choose them unconditionally. And so ultimately she's giving them back the very excuse that Paul took away in Romans chapter 1. And the reason they're not of God is because they refuse to listen to the words of the Father and they've grown calloused and hardened to his words. They could be of God if they did as Cornelius and others uh, of that day had done and listened to the Father and humbled themselves and feared the Lord. That's what humble, humbling yourself is, is fearing God, recognizing yourself in light of his holiness. If you had done that, then you would listen and learn from me because I'm from the Father. That's the point that, that Jesus is making. He's not trying to say um, you're, you're not of God based upon my choosing unconditionally before you were ever born. He's saying you're not of the Father because you have refused to listen to me all these years. John 18, 37, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So God's election. So are you of the truth unconditionally for no cause of your own or do you have responsibility to be of the truth? In other words, can, can you be, could these people who are saying who are not of the truth, could they have done otherwise? I say yes, that's why they're responsible. That's why they're blameworthy, because they are not of the truth because of their own rebellion against the truth, not because of God's rejection of them before the foundation of the world in the condition they were born that have, they have absolutely no control over. Actually precedes faith. This is why some believe and some do not. Uh, Romans. So what she's just saying, the reason some believe and some do not is because God has unconditionally elected some and not others. And ultimately, it puts the responsibility back on God, not only for those who believe, but also for those who do not believe, because ultimately they're not believing for reasons beyond their control. 9, 1 through 23, uh, John Piper interprets this particular text, which we've read before, um, as saying, or he has his commentary on this text, is that God's election is preserved in its unconditionality because it is transacted before we are born and have or have done any good or evil. The text says this. And so that's not only unconditional election to salvation, if you read that text congruently, it's also unconditional election to reprobation, to damnation. In other words, before the twins did anything good or bad, if you're reading that about salvation versus who's going to carry the promise, then you're ultimately saying that Esau was condemned to hell before he did anything bad, and you're still calling him blameworthy. In other words, he's being unconditionally reprobated if you're reading that text that way how how in the world can you call that just anyone in, in intuitively and even biblically 
reading throughout Scripture could not call it just to condemn somebody before they even do and, at, and without regard to anything they've ever done that's bad. And that's ultimately the way that you would have to read that verse. For he says to Moses, God says to Moses, this is God through Paul, um, I have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Um, again, I've written a book on this, Potter's Promise. I go through verse by verse through all of this. That's a quote out of Exodus 32 and 33, right after the golden calf incidents, when uh, the, the Israelites deserved to be destroyed for their idolatry against God. They rebelled against God. They deserved to be destroyed. God even says he intended to destroy them before Moses steps up and says, if you're going to kill them, kill me. And he pleads on their behalf like a Christ-like figure saying, I'll be the intercessory here. I'll be the mediator here. I'll pray for their, uh, their salvation. I want them to be saved. And God's response is, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. He's speaking not about individuals being saved. He's talking about being patient with them. Showing mercy to someone is not the same as irresistibly saving them. Showing mercy to somebody means to refrain from punishing them from what they deserve to be punished for, okay? So when he says, I will have mercy on Israel, if I wanna have mercy on them so as to fulfill my purposes through this nation, then that's my prerogative as father, as God, as sovereign, as king. I can choose to punish them and destroy them, or I can, des I can have patience towards these objects of wrath so as to fulfill my purpose of bringing redemption to all the families of the world, which is the promise he made to Abraham. So it's not about salvation of these Jews. It's about him showing them kindness, mercy, so as to accomplish his ultimate redemptive plan through them as a nation. Christ would come through these people. So if he destroys them all, then the promise he made to Abraham would not be fulfilled, and God does not break his promise. And so he's showing them mercy, i.e. being patient with objects that are prepared for destruction, so as to accomplish his redemptive plan, his good purpose, through their rebellious activity. Okay, which is exactly the point that he's getting to in Romans chapter 9, because the question is, has God's purpose failed? Has God's promise to Israel failed? And he's saying no, because God can show mercy to them when he wants to show them mercy, i.e. not destroy them, even though they deserve to be destroyed. And he can even harden them if he chooses to harden them, meaning he can give them over to their rebellious condition so as to accomplish redemption through their rebellion. After all, they're the ones who cry out, crucify him. And crucify him was actually his pre-purposed plan for Israel. In other words, God was using their hardened rebellion to bring about the very thing he promised Abraham he would do, that through his crucifixion, all the families of the earth would be blessed, i.e. redemption would be brought to all people through their rebellion. So God is sealing them over in the rebellious condition. By the way, they're rebellious freely, not by decree. They are rebellious. Therefore, God uses them in the rebellion to bring about a good purpose through their rebellion. He is not causing, i.e. decreeing, i.e. sovereignly bringing about their rebellion so as to bring about the crucifixion. He simply knows and uses their rebellion in the condition of those days, in the circumstances of those days. He's using them in that rebellion to bring about his purpose, which is exactly why one of them might say, well, then why are you to blame me? If my rebellion is ultimately a part of your plan, if my rebellion free rebellion, by the way, is ultimately what you are going to use to bring about redemption for all people, then why are you to blame me? That's the interlocutor in Romans chapter 9. The interlocutor in Romans 9 is not some reprobate who was unconditionally chosen for damnation before he was ever born, which is what Calvinists read into Romans 9 in order to support their theological worldview, and it's just unfounded. Okay. As I've done before, I'm cutting in on my own broadcast to break this up into two segments because, yes, surprise, surprise, I went longer than I expected to. So you have to stay tuned to see the, <laughs> the second half of my critique of Ali Stuckey's uh, broadcast on uh, Calvinism. So stay tuned. See you next time. <laughs> God bless. Bye-bye. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.